Our passage today comes from Romans chapter 10. Uh, Romans chapter 10. So while you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. Have any of you ever heard, or I should say, have any of you ever made excuses? Oh, yeah. And one of the biggest excuses that we use, and this is one I've used, is I didn't know or I wasn't aware, right? You claim ignorance. <laughs> that's, that's what we often do. We often try to make excuses. But the thing is, it turns out is sometimes we make that excuse when we do know, and then sometimes when it comes to, say, the law or anything like that, it doesn't matter if we didn't know, we still broke the law. I remember one time I was, this was ages ago, I was traveling down to, down through Alexandria, and I was taking that side, the 71 bypass over there, and I was crossing on that thing, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, lights behind me. I was going 55 in a 45. So I missed the speed limit sign. I didn't know, but I was still culpable. I was still responsible, even though I didn't know. But the scripture we're going to look at today, it's going to give us, show us that we don't have that excuse. We can't make the excuse that we didn't know, because after this, you're going to know. And so we're in Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. Now, what Paul is doing in this section, he starts in Romans chapter 9, and he's talking about the people of Israel. And he's talking about what's going on with them and, and why they've rejected the gospel. And in Romans 9, he says God had every right as God, as creator, to set up the system of salvation he wanted to set up. And that system was a salvation that came by faith, by trusting in Jesus. So the people of Israel, they thought it was because of who they are, who they were. They were Abraham's descendants. They thought, well, we've got to keep this law. We've got to do all these rules. And so the people of Israel, they, they were making, they had these excuses in their heads. But Paul says, no, no, it's by faith. It doesn't matter who you are. That's why it's for Gentiles and Jews alike. It's not about works, it's about trusting in Jesus. That's what saves you. And he comes to chapter 10 and he talks about that responsibility and how that salvation is obtained. And so we're going to learn three things about salvation, three truths about salvation in these verses. First of all, we're going to learn that salvation is not by works. You cannot earn salvation. You don't merit it. You don't deserve it. You can't do anything to get it. Second, we're going to see that God offers salvation to everybody. Since it's not by works or based upon who you are or your ancestors or your family or anything like that, he offers it to everybody. And then we're going to see that we are sent to extend that salvation to other people as well. So let's take a look at the first thing that we're going to look at here. Salvation is not by works. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, talking about Israel, is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on the law shall live by that righteousness. We cannot earn salvation. He's talking about the people of Israel here. And he's right. He first of all says there in verse 1, he wants their salvation. He wants them to be saved. Now, the people of Israel really didn't think they needed to be saved. One, they were Abraham's descendants. They thought that that made everything right. They had God's law, and so they thought keeping it, that's just what they're supposed to do. They, were, they weren't really looking for any kind of a savior because, at least for a spiritual savior goes, because they had in mind, well, we just want to be free from Rome. They were looking for a political savior. They were looking for a military savior, somebody who would come in and kind of reestablish the way things used to be for them. But Paul says, no, I want their salvation. I'm praying for their salvation. He wants that for them. And we should want the same thing for everybody that we encounter, even the people who are causing troubles for us, because Paul himself, a Jew, he, the Jews caused him troubles. They really did. But he still wants them to be saved. He didn't write them off. And it's not that these were bad people at all. They were actually probably they were good, moral, upright people. We'd say about it. They were zealous for God, verse 2 says. He says they, they have a zeal for God. They wanted to please God. They wanted to please God. They had a zeal for him. But the thing is, is a zeal not in accordance with knowledge. Because they were acting out of, in some ways, ignorance. They had God's law, but they were acting in a way that God didn't intend for their law to be for them. 
they had said, you know what? This, God's given us these laws to do, and that's what we're going to do. And so they made it about righteousness, the righteousness that is found in the law. It says, for not knowing about God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own. You see, God had a, a means of righteousness. And we were talking about righteousness. We need to understand it. There's like three ways we can understand righteousness. One is that you are just. That's not really the context of these verses here. Another one is that you are, it's about right living. You're doing the right things. And then another, the other way to look at it is you're talking about a right relationship with God, being right with God. And so, and these ideas, what, what happened is, and this is sometimes that we do the same thing that the Israelites did. See, the Israelites, when God gave, say, the Ten Commandments and he gave them all these laws, they were already in a relationship with God. God didn't give the Ten Commandments. He didn't give all those laws for them to enter into a relationship with God because they already were. He gave those laws for them so that they could understand God's standard of righteousness, so that they could be separated out from everybody else around them, so that they could live in good, godly lives. They had confused being right with God with living in a good, godly way, in a good, moral way. They had kind of mixed those two things up, and we do those things. They sought to establish their own means of righteousness by the law. Because here's the thing. If you do the law, you've got to do all the law, right? 613 commandments in the Old Testament there. Imagine trying to live that way. Hard to do, right? I mean, you need to keep everything. And so, you know, God had built in systems for, for forgiveness and, and sacrifice and atonement and all these things. But they sought their own way to do it, and so they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. They weren't doing things God's way. They were doing what God wanted them to do, but they were doing it the wrong way. They had put the wrong emphasis in the put the emphasis in the wrong place. Because here's the deal: even in the Old Testament, it was by faith. That's how you are right with God. This is Paul's already talked about this in Romans. He points back to Abraham. Abraham believed. He trusted in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It's not that he kept all the laws. Abraham messed up quite a bit. Lied about who his wife was a couple times. But here's the thing. Abraham trusted. He believed. And that was credited to him as righteousness. And the Israelites had messed it up. And so here's the thing. How are we to understand this? Verse 4 tells us that for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That word end there is the idea of fulfillment, of completion, of wrapping things up. And so the law was given. God gave the law to Israel so that they would, one, know how to live in a way that pleased him by faith. But what does that look like lived out? To separate them from the people around them to show that everybody else that they were his people. They weren't like everybody else. But how do we understand that with the law and, and us and Christ? Well, Jesus completed it all. He's the only one who kept all those laws. He kept the heart of law. He taught the heart of the law. They were so focused on the letter of doing this and doing that that they missed what was going on on the inside. That was his complaint about the Pharisees all the time. You do this, you do this, that's good, but you're not doing this. And this is what really matters. The principle underlying all those commands, all those laws. Jesus summed it all up. He lived it all up. And if we're trusting in him, if we are in Christ and we're living for him, we're no longer guided by those laws. We're guided by the Holy Spirit, God himself who lives within us. We live rightly because we're in a right relationship. We don't live rightly to enter into a right relationship with God. We don't get right with God by living rightly. We get right with God, and then we live rightly. That's what uh, he quotes Deuteronomy in verse 5, our references. It writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on the law shall live by that righteousness. If you want to keep one part of the law, you've got to keep whole part of the law. This is the problem with legalism. If you want to try to live your life by all those various rules and all those commands, well, you have to live by every single one of them. Sorry for us in the South, no crawfish, no catfish, no bacon, all those little things. If you want to live by a part of it, you've got to live by all of it. But we're no longer bound by those laws because we are separated from everybody else in the world because we have God living within us. We're living for him. That's the way we are supposed to be. That's where, they were, that's where the people of Israel were messing up. 
They so focused on who they were in, in one sense, they forgot who God was. They were acting outside of that. But see, the thing is, it's, it's not based upon what we do. We cannot earn salvation. We can't keep enough rules, can't keep enough laws to make it worth it. Because it's not. Because it, once, God is holy, right? And one little sin will separate us from God because God is completely pure and completely holy. And he will not tolerate sin forever. One day he's going to come and he's going to judge sin. He already poured out wrath upon Jesus on the cross to pay for those who would trust in him and believe. But one day those who haven't trusted in Jesus, who the atonement, who that price hasn't been paid for in the sense that they haven't trusted in Jesus to receive it, they're going to experience God's judgment too. And that's not going to be a great day. Not for a lot of people. But here's the deal. It's not about works. It's not about doing good. It's not about doing all the right things or checking that list and following all the rules. That won't get you. It's not about who your ancestors were. It's not about if your family members were church members or they were members of the church or even you're a member of a church. None of that matters because it's all about trusting in Jesus. And because it's not about who we are or what we do, God offers salvation to everybody. Let's look at verses 6 through 13. Starting at verse 6. But the righteousness based on faith, not the law, based on faith, speaks as follows. And here he quotes Deuteronomy again. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved saved. It's not about works, it's about faith. That's what it's about. Salvation comes by faith. And he says, starts here, he quotes, he goes, don't say in your heart, who's going to go into heaven? And he says, to bring Christ down. We don't have to try to go and bring God down to us. We're not reaching up to bring God down to us or to reach up to God in some sense. Either like the people at Tower of Babel, they wanted to bring God down to them. Jesus has already come down. The Son of God has already come down to us, lived among us, showed us how we're to live, taught us how we're to live, and died for our sins to pay the penalty that we all deserve. The righteousness that comes from faith doesn't seek to bring God down to us because He's already come down to us. Nor it says, who will, ascend, uh, who will descend into the abyss to bring Christ up from the dead? We don't have to go try to bring Christ up from that because guess what? He's already raised from the dead. We don't have to try to bring him up. He's already there. Not only is he already raised from the dead, he's ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, interceding for us. Jesus made his righteousness available to us. We don't have to strive after it. We don't have to work for it to try to reach up and bring him down or to raise him from the dead because he's already come down and he's already been raised up. That's, what, that's not what it's about. It's not about what we do in that sense. What does it say then? It's easy. Verse 8, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. It's not some far away thing that we have to seek and search and strive to find. It's not like a buried pirate treasure that we're having an a encrypted map to try to figure out where to dig. It's not that way. It's not hidden. It's not some thing that we have to like, okay, we have to put these things together, then you have to follow this process, we have to do this and that and that, and then God will do something. No. It's near you. It's right here. In your mouth and in your heart. He says, this is what we're preaching. This is the faith that we're preaching. This is the trust that's here. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Believe and confess. Now, these aren't two separate things. These are kind of like two sides of the same coin. It's the same act as one inspires the other and one flows from the other. Believe in your heart. Or confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. 
Confess means to say the same thing as, to agree with something else. So you are saying Jesus is Lord. Now that sounds easy, right? It's easy to say those things. Well, Scripture tells us that we can't say that without the help of the Holy Spirit. But also, put yourself back in the ancient world for a moment there. The word Lord carried some heavy connotation. If you were a Jew, this was the Greek word that was used to translate the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord, which was used they substituted for the name of God, Yahweh. So, now you could, you could say it in Greek, and, and you could, it can mean something like boss, depending on your context, like your master, Lord thing. But for the most part, they reserve this for God. So to call Jesus as Lord, guess what you're doing? You're calling Jesus God. You're saying, you're putting him in the place of God and saying, he is the Lord of my life. He is the one who commands me. He is the one who controls me. He is God. Now, if you're a Greek, this word was often used in emperor worship because the emperors had it in their head that people should worship them as gods. And so they created the cult of emperor worship. And so you would go offer sacrifices. You would call the emperor Lord. So it's him and his divine aspect. But if you call Jesus Lord, that means you're putting Jesus in the place of the emperor. You're saying, no, no, the emperor's not Lord. He doesn't control me. I answer not to the emperor. I answer to Jesus. I'm putting Jesus in that place. He tells me what to do. He commands me. He is my Lord, not the emperor. Now, if you did this, if you confessed Jesus is Lord, you said Jesus is Lord, you could lose your job. You could lose your friends. You could lose your family. So it's, it's simple to do, right? But it's not so hard to do. It's easy, it can be easy to say the words, but to actually mean it when your life depends upon it. We can say it flippantly these days. But in the ancient world... No. You're saying something profound. You're saying something deep. And that confession, Jesus is Lord, flows from our belief. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You believe in Jesus' resurrection. Now, why is that so important? Why not just say believe in Jesus? He says that elsewhere. But the resurrection is so important because, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if the resurrection didn't happen, we are still in our sins. We have no hope. Christianity is meaningless and useless and of no good to anybody, and we are of all men most to be pitied. When we say we believe in the resurrection, that God raised Jesus from the dead, we're saying that Jesus paid that penalty for our sins and rose from the dead, conquering death, that we might have eternal life with God. We can have an eternal relationship with God because of what Jesus did on the cross. So if we confess that Jesus is Lord, that means we submit to him, all of us, we, because we've believed in our heart that God raised him from the dead so that we can have that relationship with God, God promises here, you will be saved. Why? For that with a heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. Trusting in God brings us into relationship with God. A right relationship with God, not based upon what we do, not based upon who we are or who we were, not based upon our family, not based upon our circumstances. It's all about who God is and who Jesus is and what he's done. He's the one who makes us right with him. Because we trust in Jesus. And then it says, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. We can't, you know, it's not meant to be kept inside. We are delivered. We are saved from our sin. The penalty of sin when we trust in Jesus. We are being saved right now throughout our lives. In the present sense, present tense, we're being saved from the power of sin over us. We can say no to sin. We don't have to say yes to sin now. Oftentimes we still do, do still say yes to sin. It's not the way it's supposed to be, but that's the way it is. But we are being saved, and we will be saved in the future. We will be completely saved from the presence of sin in our lives. We will have resurrected bodies. That's why another, another reason the resurrection is so important. We will have bodies that are not prone to decay and death. No sorrow, no pain, no inclination to sin. We will be perfect. We will be as He is. That deliverance is something that we have to look forward to. Salvation, we can't forget salvation in all of its things. The salvation from the penalty, from the power, and from the presence of sin. When we confess Jesus as Lord, when we submit to Him as Lord, He is going to do that. He is going to do that. 
Verse 11 says this, For the scripture says, Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There is assurance in salvation. There is assurance in this. Who calls upon the name of the Lord, who believes in him, will not be disappointed. You won't be let down. Now, we can, there's a lot of things that we can trust in in this world. And they're going to let us down. How many of you have ever had somebody that you trusted and who just kind of like turned their back on you? Everybody ever betrayed you, abandoned you, let you down? You expected somebody to do something and they said they were going to do it and they didn't do it? Well, that's not who God is. When God makes a promise, guess what? He's going to keep that promise. If he says, hey, you won't be disappointed, if you trust in me, I will take care of it all. Sometimes we let ourselves down too, though, don't we? That's not the same thing with God. There's assurance in the salvation that God offers. Because guess what? It's not about what we do. We didn't earn it, did we? We didn't work for it. We didn't do anything to get it and deserve it and merit it. Well, guess what? You can't do anything to turn back God's grace and his gift and his salvation. Because God is a God who keeps his promises and he says, I've got you. And this salvation, this, this assurance, it it's, should encourage us to, one, live for him now, but also to, to respond to him whenever he calls us to do something. And this salvation is offered to everybody. Every single person on this planet is able to receive this. Now, does everybody receive it? No. Some people are blinded by their own sins. Some people have all sorts of obstacles and stumbling blocks in front of them. But this, God, this offer of salvation is to everybody. Verse 12 and 13, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Doesn't matter who you are. That's everybody on this planet, Jew and Greek. That's it. That's everybody. There's no distinction. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on Him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Doesn't matter your background. You could be, you could come from a, a family that's been in church for ages. You've never really done anything wrong. You've grown up in the church. You, you follow all the rules. That doesn't mean anything. You could be somebody who started sinning greatly at a very young age and kept on sinning and just piled up heaps and heaps and heaps of sin. Well, that doesn't matter. All that matters is Jesus and trusting in Him. Because the person who's done all the right things, who's grown up in the church, who's been in the church for all their lives, they could still be going to hell because they never trusted in Jesus. They were trusting in their system. They were trusting in doing the right things. They may have been even baptized. None of that matters. The person over here who had heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of sin for ages and ages of their life, they trust in Jesus. They're saved. Because it's not about who we are or what we've done in our lives. Because it's all about trust in Jesus. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. God stands ready to deliver and to save and to rescue us from our sin. He wants to bring every single human being into a relationship with Him, but He's not going to force that. Jesus died for everybody, but not everybody will benefit because God says it is by faith. By grace you are saved through faith, not of works that no one may boast. It's the free gift of God, salvation is. Wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So just ask yourselves, examine yourselves for a minute before we move on to the third point here. We've seen that salvation isn't by works and God's, salvation, God's offer of salvation is for everybody. But ask yourself this. First of all, am I still trying to please God by what I do? By following a checklist of rules. Because even believers can fall into this trap. We can become legalists. And the worst problem about legalists, and I know because I grew up being one, is that you make excuses for your own sins, but you hold everybody else to a standard you're not willing to live up to yourself. You bend the rules, but it will require the, everybody else to follow the rules. Just like the Pharisees. But asking your heart, are you trying to work at it? 
Or are you resting in your relationship and letting those good works flow from your relationship with God rather than letting your good works determine your relationship with God? You've got to ask yourselves that. That's, everybody has to do that at some point. Because we can get into patterns. We can get into some bad patterns. Hypocritical patterns even. So ask yourselves that. Now maybe you're here today, maybe you've never trusted in Jesus. And you're trying to do it on your own. Well, that's not going to work. You're going to be disappointed that way. Because you're going to fall flat on your face. But if you trust in Jesus, you call on him, you will be saved. And for those of us who are saved, sometimes, uh, do you ever get doubtful about based upon what you do? Maybe you're not doubting God, but you're doubting yourself. You're doubting what God is doing in your life because of what's going on in your life. You can have assurance that God saves you. You don't have to be disappointed. You can rest in him, and he will take care of the rest. Now, we are all called to respond to God's offer of salvation. And once we've responded, guess what? God still calls us, and he calls us to do more, because he calls every single one of us to share this good news. He wants us to participate in this offer of salvation. Verses 14 and 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they're sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. People can't believe, trust in Jesus because guess what? They can't call on him because they can't trust in him. If they can't, they can't trust in him because no one's, they haven't heard. They've got to hear the good news. And so they can't hear the good news unless somebody is uh, sent. And guess what? You know, got, people got to be sent. Here's the thing. Every single one of us believers, Christians, those who follow Jesus, every single one of us has been sent. The Great Commission over Matthew 28. Go and make disciples. Dot, dot, dot. Make disciples is the, is the key thing in that verse. It's not merely making people who, you know, making converts in the sense of people who claim the name. There are a lot of people who claim the name of Christian who they're not. We're talking about people who follow Jesus. And that's the main verb in there, but the other part of that is go. It's known as an attendant circumstance participle in the Greek. It is the undergirding action that goes along with the main verb. As you go, in your going, as you live your life, wherever you may be, (coughs) make disciples. You see, we are all sent. The gospel, the good news, is something that we are all to share. We've got good news. Do you keep good news to yourself? Something good happens to you. You can't wait to tell somebody about it, right? Kids, you pass your test. You can't wait to say you pass your test, right? No? Or are you just not going to talk about tests? Okay. <laughs> School's out. We won't talk about tests. But that's the thing, right? Good news happens. We want to share it. Except for, when it comes to the good news of Jesus, we don't want to share it. I admit, I've been guilty of this. I get caught up in the distractions. I'm a very task-oriented person, so if I'm focused on a task, <laughs> I don't think about some things. I'm focused on this. That's not the way I'm supposed to be. It's the way I am, but it's not the way I'm working on it. But we have good news to share. And we can't let fear of what the other person might say. We can't let fear of questions that they might have. We can't let fear of rejection. That's not on us. We have been called to share. We're not called to worry about the rest of it. God's going to take care of that. He has just called us to share what Jesus has done for us, for me, for you. You see, each one of us has a story, right? Each one of us has a story, and each one of us has a different story. There might be similarities, but our stories are our stories. They're different. But we can say, this is what Jesus has done for me. This is who Jesus is. This is what he's done. This is what he's done for me. This is how he has changed me. This is how he is transforming me. This is what he's doing in my life because I trusted in him. We can tell that to other people. That's good news. Good news that they need because they are perishing. And the offer is for everybody, and God wants us and wants us to participate in sh- sharing that, in spreading his kingdom to everybody on this earth. And there's a reward of how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. When someone brings you good news, 
And it might be, and it's good news for you. You smile at that person, don't you? You you want them, you want people to bring you good news. Good news is always welcome, and that's this idea. People, when they receive God's good news, they trust in Jesus. Man, that's something else. That's a it's a, a whole other experience when they smile at you after receiving Jesus. But we're all called. And God will reward us too for simply doing what he wants us to do. God promises rewards. And sometimes we don't know what effect we will have. Now, and it doesn't matter. We could be, you could be sitting here, you could be called to full-time ministry. You could be called to be a missionary in some other country somewhere or internationally here working with people. Or it's just in your job and amongst your friends. Ministry is for everybody. Whether you're vocational, full-time, or not. God is going, wants us to use us, and we don't know what might happen. Now, Chuck Swindoll tells the story of a man who came up to him one day. You know, you're familiar with Chuck Swindoll, radio, uh, preacher on the radio? Uh, came up to him one day and shook his hand. This man had started listening to Swindoll on the radio, not knowing anything about him or his ministry. What Swindoll said uh, sort of made sense, but it wasn't it was unlike anything he had ever believed before. He tuned in again, and again. In recounting this, the man suddenly threw his arms around Swindoll in a bear hug. Come here, you are my spiritual father. Why was he so happy? Well, he'd heard the good news of God's salvation from someone who cared enough about lost souls to reach out to them, who prayed that God would work through him to reach others, and who shared that wonderful message. Now, you don't have to have a radio program to share the gospel. You don't have to be a preacher or an evangelist. You just have to be you. Because guess what? you might be the only Bible that some people ever read, that some people ever see. People, there are people out there who doubt this book. They don't even think this is the Word of God. But by your life, by your actions, and by your words, you are a testimony to what God has done. So don't be afraid to hide your light. Hide it under a bushel? No. Let your light shine. Speak God's truth. Speak God's word. Love on other people that they might receive God's offer of salvation. So what is God calling you to do? In just a moment, we'll have a, a time of response. But what is God calling you to do? Because he calls each and every single one of us to different things. Maybe it's to share the gospel with that person that, that, that in your workplace or that person that you know from the store that you see regularly. Maybe it's to a stranger. Maybe it's, you need to say, you know what? If Jesus is Lord of my life, i got to give him everything. All of my life. I don't need, I don't need to be holding anything back. i got to give it to him. Whatever God is calling you to do, now is the time to respond. Now is the time to respond. We don't know what time we have left. We leave these doors... We don't know what's going to happen. And so we have to make the most of every opportunity that we have been given. Respond to God with a yes, and you will not be disappointed because he is going to take care of everything. Let's pray. Almighty God, Lord, we come to you and we thank you for your wonderful love towards us. We thank you for the salvation that you offer. We thank you for the, the glorious freedom that you provide for us in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would help us to, to live for you, to, to do good works out of the right relationship we have. Lord, help us to avoid legalism. Help us to avoid trying to do things to please you rather than trusting in you. Help us to live by faith, O oh Lord. Lord, use us. Use us to spread your kingdom. Work in our hearts that we might share the good news with other people. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.